Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Duong, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the SIPA Emerging Professionals, Rebecca Napolitano of Sassios Adamopoulos, and Joe Callis to the fourth part of our webinar series, Accessing Heritage Places from Home. During this webinar, we'll be talking about the ethics of heritage recording, a topic closely related to the aims of our International Scientific Committee. Professor Mario Santana will be chairing today's event, which will be divided into three parts. In the first part, academics and professionals in the field of heritage recording will address the need for ethical principles or a code of ethics applicable to the heritage recording specialist. The panel will also discuss the profound respect that those creating these digital products are called upon to extend towards the public, the stakeholders, and the communities associated with these historic places. In the second part, there will be questions from invited experts, after which we will have an open forum and the audience questions will be addressed by the panelists. But first, we'd like to invite the president of SIPA, Stratos Dalianidis, associate professor at the School of Spatial Planning and Development and vice rector for research and lifelong learning at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Stratos, go ahead. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, first of all, let me express my sincere thanks to all the organizers for um, uh, for this wonderful event that we will have uh, the opportunity to discuss uh, with all the experts and uh, of course the moderators in such a challenging uh, issue. Uh, and you know, it's um, almost let's say 20, 25 years after the um, the principles that we we had in 1996 and it's a good opportunity that we are trying to revisit uh, so as to to open this new discussion about uh, how can we apply ethics on digital recording uh, for conserving uh, our heritage our monuments and you know i think the most important because i don't want to to spend uh, so much time uh, the, the the speakers are so many and it's better if we have the opportunity to for more Q&A uh, Q um, time. Uh, I think the most important thing in this process is to try to gain as many as possible experiences from different disciplines, from different origins, from different perspectives, so as to, let's say, so as to reshape um, uh, this new uh, framework. Huh? Uh, about uh, ethics on uh, digital recording and documentation towards uh, conservation. Uh, I would like to thank you all once again uh, for um, managing and this uh, at this difficult period to uh, to have so many people. I, uh, I see now more than uh, 100 people, 120 almost, uh, and uh, we all. Uh, looking forward to hearing uh, uh, from the from the speakers uh, and and have their insights on uh, on this uh, intriguing uh, issue. Thank you once again. Many thanks to Stratos for the uh, work, warm uh, welcome address. Uh, next, we would like to. Uh, welcome uh, Chris uh, Weeb, Manager for Heritage Policy and Government Relations at the National Trust for Canada to briefly address the importance of uh, digital access and documentation of heritage sites. Uh, then we are inviting uh, Professor Mario Santana Quintero, Vice President of ECOMOS and Professor at uh, Carleton University to introduce the topic and the aims of the event. Uh, Chris. Thanks, Stathis. Uh Yes, I'm Chris Weave, and I'm the uh, I work at the National Trust for Canada, and we're delighted. The National Trust is delighted to be collaborating with our partners on this series of webinars with SEPA Emerging Professionals, ECOMOS, and the uh, NSER Create Heritage Engineering Program at Carleton University. Created in 1973, uh, the National Trust is a national membership-based charity that leads and inspires action for Canada's historic places. An example of some of the events we organize uh, is depicted on the screen right now. It was Mokinstis, uh, the Calgary Indigenous Heritage Roundtable, which happened in that city a few years ago. 
One of the National Trust programs is Regeneration Works, which offers tools, training, and support for communities. Uh, and you can see uh, some of these resources on the web links on our screen. You know, this, this four-part webinar series, Accessing Heritage Places from Home, has been a real thrill for the National Trust. Uh, these webinars bring together an international heritage community, and that helps break down the silos between heritage volunteers, academics, and professionals. From what we've seen, the COVID pandemic has accelerated the adoption of digital tools by heritage organizations and advocacy groups uh, in Canada and all around the world. Historic sites and museums often run by uh, nonprofit groups with limited capacity. They're scrambling to create an online presence for their organizations. And it's often a matter of financial survival for them to, to quickly uh, bring that uh, up online. And at the same time, there's a real burgeoning interest on another on another's angle, uh, burgeoning interest in citywide inventories and surveys, like one that I just heard about in Calgary, Alberta, uh, just the other day, that's giving heritage new relevance and new political profile. So these are dynamic and momentous times, and groups like SEPA, ECOMOS, and NSERCREATE have a key role to play in democratizing the insights that those organizations have gained around the opportunities and downsides of digital documentations. These webinars, drawing on a wide range of practitioners and discourses, have been a tremendous opportunity to broaden that conversation and insight. And I'm really looking forward to learning more from our distinguished panel today. And with that, I'll hand things back to Becca and Stathis. Mario, you are up next. Yes. Hi, Joe, can you stop uh, sharing? Thank you. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night to everyone. And thank you for joining this uh, part four of the series of webinars that have been organized by, <clears throat> by the partners that uh, Chris we've just mentioned. And in particular, I would like to thank uh, Michelle, Becca, Joe, Statis, uh, and Lori, and the National Trust, and, and also in particular, our President Stratos uh, from the Heritage Documentation Committee of ICOMOS and ISPRS and the executive members that are participating, and also to our distinguished group of panelists uh, and, uh, that are going to talk to you about this very important issue. I don't wanna repeat what Chris already said, so I would like to focus on, on a number of things. So you look, if you look at your screen, you will see some images of Abu Simbel. And Abu Simbel is an emblematic uh, symbol of international cooperation to safeguard a site and is actually also the, um, the background to the, to the UNESCO World Heritage Convention, which in 2022 will be uh, joining 50 years of existence. And it has been very helpful for all of us uh, in general to, to have an international fra framework that protects heritage. In the case of Abu Simbel, uh, Maurice Carbonell, who was a photogrammetrist, uh, worked on the recording using digital photogrammetry for these temples. Then another um, character that I would like you to see is Pierre Prichard. Pierre Prichard is also a French architect who worked over years in the 80s and the 90s to make an inventory of Bagan in Myanmar. And you see here eight volumes of this inventory that up to today is being used for the conservation of this important site. And with these two kind of elements, I would like to bring to your attention the importance of documentation and also the importance of sharing knowledge about documentation and this documentation being useful for conservation. So today we're going to look at who, the specific role of a heritage recording specialist, and we have invited a number of, of emerging professionals that will be uh, very good in, in illustrating these points. So we have a lot of existing frameworks uh, for uh, heritage uh, ethics. We have the, ethic, the ICOMOS ethical principles, the code of professional conduct and ethics from the Canadian Heritage Association of Professionals. And we have the ICOMOS principles for the recording of monuments, groups of buildings and sites among others. And this document we are gonna be talking also today because it's due for revision. So in the ICOMOS principles, we have different aspects, but one aspect that brings to the attention is the responsibility for recording. So it re requires the deployment of individuals with adequate skills, knowledge, and awareness. Uh, usually working in collaboration, 
those heritage recorders work with a multidisciplinary team to develop information that will be that will inform the process of conservation and all managers of cultural heritage are responsible for ensuring the adequate recording quality and updating the record. So this is just a background for you to tell you about those principles. If we look at the current actors in heritage recording, we have academia, we have government for profit, intergovernmental organizations, non for profit partnerships and research projects. And among our panelists, we have representative of these different uh, groups of, of, of actors. So um, heritage documentation brings a lot to the table and to the conservation and dissemination and awareness of knowledge. But we have to make sure that we don't monumentally create a digital record, that we misuse the terminology of digital preservation because digital recording is just one more, one tool of the, um, of the a range of, of techniques that we use for conservation of heritage. We also have to prevent not perceived to be digital colonialism or digital appropria uh, appropriation of data from other sites. If a Canadian expert is working in an Asian country that I don't appropriate that, that data from myself. Uh, there are also issues of longevity of the data, interpretation and transparency of that data that is collected. So there are different ethical categories. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details. Today we're going to talk a little bit about ethical conduct uh, responsibilities to the public and communities, uh, and also related to qualifications and the respect to other heritage recording specialists. And that's why we have grouped this, this group of people. The idea of developing an updated of the principles of ICOMOS is to provide, a, basically to improve the professional practice, but also to benefit, um, to have a collaborative manner in, in which we record sites. Uh, to provide uh, better information to the public in general and also include the community living on those heritage sites to be responsible of the data that is being collected. And also one of the biggest beneficiaries of this framework will be the cultural heritage organization, including the for-profit, non-for-profit government and intergovernmental academia and funding agencies to provide guidance on how to do the work. So today we're going to talk about conduct, responsibilities, professional practice and deliver data. And I would like to thank our um, panelists for dealing with these issues. And as you can see, we have a great group of people. And then we have a follow up of commentators, people who are more advanced in their career, who will be querying some questions to our panelists to lead the, the discussion. And then we are going to open the floor for some audience uh, discussions. So with this, I, I close my intervention and I, I wish everyone an excellent uh, event. Mario, thanks for that great introduction. Next, we're gonna begin with the panelist portion of the event, as Mario already alluded to. The panel will be addressing three topics. For each topic, We'll first be introducing the panelists themselves, and then they will each have four minutes to express their arguments. The first topic that we're going to talk about today is conduct and will be addressed by Julie, William, and Casey. Stop us. Okay, so uh, Julie Vanoff is a graduate and researcher at the Carlton Immersive Media Studio, exploring the application of digital twin technologies at a regional scale. Her research focuses on the relationships between virtual digital representations and their physical manifestations and how these transformations impact our understanding of place. Dr. William McGarry is a, a landscape archaeologist and a geospatial uh, specialist with a particular interest in the intersections between technology, heritage management and climate change. He is senior lecturer at the School of Natural and Deep Environment, uh, Queen's University Belfast, and is an expert member of ICAM. Uh, as part of the working group on climate change and cultural heritage, he coordinated the 2019 uh, Google Arts and Culture Funded Heritage uh, on the Edge project for ECOMOS, which utilizes remote sensing technologies, interviews, and expert narratives from five World Heritage sites to stress urgency about climate change. Casey Hardick is an archaeologist and uh, SciArc's director of project development. Casey brings a decade of experience working in cultural heritage with a strong focus on working with local communities. 
Casey works to ensure that the digital products produced can be used to support site conservation and outreach activities. He is involved from initial site scoping to project completion and is heavily involved in SIARC's workshop and capacity building programs. His uh, research interests include human impacts on the natural environment and the ways technology and culture can be used as catalysts for economic development. Uh, so, Julie is first. Julie, the floor is yours. Can we hear Julie? Ah, there we go. Pardon me. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Julie Ivanoff, and I'm a researcher at the Carlton Immersive Media Studio, SIMS. And as was previously mentioned, I'm researching the application of digital twin technologies at a regional scale. And at SIMS, I'm leading the project of imagining Canada's digital twin. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the concept of a digital twin, uh, it was first coined in the early 2000s by Dr. Michael Greaves, and it's widely used in the aerospace industry for optimizing the design and manufacture of products. So a digital twin is a system consisting of three parts, a physical thing, its digital equivalent, and data connections between the two. And so this is used to guide engineers and designers as to how to improve performance and production of the product. Uh, a digital twin is a cybernetic system where the feedback gathered from the twins, the physical product and the digital product, is essential for contributing to the evolution of the systems. A digital twin is dynamic and alive. It updates itself almost simultaneously um, in a cybernetic feedback loop. And up until now, digital twin technology has been used to develop systems with clearly defined boundaries at an appropriate scale, so products and objects, but that scale has been growing. And now we see it applied to buildings and building information models, and it's growing to campuses, communities, and cities. Uh, the project we're working on at SIMS um, is imagining digital twin at a national scale. So what would a digital twin of Canada be? Now, imagining Canada's digital twin is far from being defined for such a complex system. Uh, it has more questions than answers, and it's going to take a lot of time and discussion for many groups to understand exactly what it could be and what it ought to be. What we do know is it needs to be inclusive to represent all of Canada, and it needs to be accessible to the public and serve Canadians. So how can we and how should we do that? Uh, we need to ask, how do we appropriately collect and manage data? Now, Norbert Wiener, the, uh, he's known as the father of cybernetics, he studied uh, messages as a means of control, and that has nothing to do with intention. So, like Marshall McLuhan, he understood that uh, the power of information and uh, the medium used to communicate that information, what we gather, what we share, how we gather, how we share it, influences our understanding of the world and of ourselves. So like the cybernetic feedback loop, what is collected from this, the system and then returned to it uh, greatly influences our actions. This changes the system and our current condition is affected. In his book, The Human Use of Human Beings, he explains that communication and control are inseparable. So our collective knowledge, um, the recordings of information, um, influence our actions in the present, affecting our future. So our records, that stored memory, is part of our input into the system. Uh, how that affects us, our reaction to this information, that is the output. And for the output, there are many variables, and many of those are unknown. So since we rely on the past to inform our actions for the future, we need to consider our conduct in the present. We hold a great responsibility in the collection, management, and distribution of knowledge. We need to be thoughtful of our duties as stewards of that information and not gatekeepers. Uh, what we share and with whom needs to be understood. So how do we do that? Uh, I'm not sure, but what I do know is that this requires discussion with many people to understand what we need to consider in terms of appropriate and responsible conduct. We need to work together to develop and understand how we can serve the future. And there are many questions and they're gonna require many more conversations about how we can conduct research appropriately and responsibly. 
it's a process and for imagining canada's digital twin we're just beginning this company this conversation needs to be continued with others and uh, it's a shared effort and responsibility so let's continue this conversation on ethics and conduct and imagining canada's digital twin and i'm really looking forward to the discussion later in this webinar uh, thank you for listening Thank you, Julie. And uh, next up is uh, Will. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you today. And I'd like to discuss the theme of conduct based on four broad issues, which I feel impact on good conduct and uh, best practice um, in, uh, in heritage recording. They are all interconnected. And um, I should state immediately that during my career and even quite recently, I've been guilty of most, if not all of these, to some degree. The first is the subject of loss and recording. Um, we have an ethical responsibility to conduct our research thoroughly and comprehensively. As an archaeologist, the first lesson we teach our students is that excavation is destruction and that they have a duty to record data and information in as much detail as possible. This preservation by record is a term often used in digital recording and its value has been illustrated numerous times in recent years when iconic structures or monuments have been lost, like the Glasgow School of Art pictured in the slide, and digital data used to assist in their reconstruction. We must always conduct ourselves responsibly and never ever cut corners or take shortcuts in our recording work. Secondly, I want to talk about colonialism. I come from Queen's University, Belfast, uh, which is named much like its Kingston sibling in order of Queen Victoria, who ruled over an empire built on inequality, exploitation and colonialism. While it is an uncomfortable subject for many of us, archaeology through antiquarianism and colonialism have long been close bedfellows, and I would argue that this link exists to this day. Digital technologies are often applied by researchers from the developed world to record sites and places in the less developed world, and both the cost of this technology and the knowledge about using it continue an often unhealthy dynamic which can seem exploitative. The solution to this is long-term, equal, meaningful relationships and dialogue, and not virtual collecting, which is my third point. We must ask ourselves if we are recording just for recording's sake, creating virtual collection cabinets of places which are fundamentally divorced um, and separated from their context. And digital recording uses techniques and methodologies developed not necessarily in the social sciences, but often in the hard scientists, which encourage a degree of distance and separation from the object being studied. Yet this approach is fundamentally in opposition to the emotive power of many of the places we study and their rich uh, histories and stories and their role within their local communities and landscapes. It is on this theme that I will end with some words from T.S. Eliot. In his first published poem, the poem's protagonist, Prufrock, laments his inability to find meaning in a world which lies grey before him like a patient etherized upon a table. When we conduct our work, we need to ask ourselves how we see what we are recording. Um, are they just objects or places devoid of meaning and laid out in the lab or operating theatres for a study, or do we see them for what they are? Um, meaningful, important, embodied and significant places where we are privileged to work. Thank you. Thank you, Will. And next, I'm giving the floor to uh, Casey. Casey. Thank you very much. And yes, I just want to echo, I'm really glad to be part of this discussion. Um, thank you for the opportunity. So over the past few months at SIRC, we have been reflecting on our role as a nonprofit organization that documents historic places. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement here in the United States has caused us to really think critically about the types of projects that we participate in and our complicity in elevating certain narratives and stories while sidelining others. Um, we, in short, we can do better. And we have taken this time um, while we're not traveling to reflect critically on our values and our own inherent biases and have come up with four areas that we'll be working on going forward. So the first of these has to do with site selection. Um, although oftentimes at SIRC, sites and monuments are reaching out to us directly requesting documentation assistance, we also have a significant amount of autonomy, um, an agency in identifying new sites and projects. Our mission statement, if you look on our website, references documenting the world's most significant cultural heritage. However, we have often interpreted this quite narrowly and have focused on historic monumental architecture that is easily documented with reality capture technologies. Unfortunately, this has resulted in an underrepresentation of more modern structures, vernacular architecture, 
um, as well as landscapes. Although more recent work at SIARC has tried to focus on some of these more modern structures involved in social movements, for example, we, we just did a project at the Stonewall Inn and the Women's Rights National Monument in, in New York. There's a lot more that we can do and we're committing to undertake projects that represent a much wider range of heritage places going forward. The second thing I want to talk about is um, area frame from proven has to do with the subjectivity implicit in the documentation process. Um, I think in the past we have often seen our work as impartial and focused on creating digital replicas of structures. However, we want to recognize that in our projects, we bring our own preconceptions to the work that we do. And we often make decisions about the resolution and the areas of our focus for our work based on what we perceive as imp important given time constraints. We want to just not only recognize the subjectivity that we bring to projects, but we also want to resolve to work more closely with local stakeholders to ensure that what we capture will provide value to these groups at the end of the day, because um, they're really the ones that, that matter for this work. The third area of improvement has to do with the, the stories that we tell um, through our work. Over the past several years, um, SIRC has increasingly focused on using 3D documentation of places as a medium for storytelling. And often at the same time when we are documenting the physical fabric of a structure, um, we're also trying to record audio and video interviews with site managers and local stakeholders. Given the limitations uh, at each project, we sometimes have relied on just a few voices to tell the story of a certain place. Um, for example, on the Heritage on the Edge project that Will mentioned, um, which focused on climate change impacts, we heard from some of our local partners in Bangladesh after the project was over that we should have talked to the farmers as they were the most aware of how flooding and increased sea level rise is having an impact on the community. And in future projects, we will focus on trying to engage with a larger number of stakeholders and asking our partners on the ground who we should speak to ensure that we are not missing important voices. The final area of improvement has to do with the importance of listening and engaging in meaningful dialogue with local partners and stakeholders at all stages of a project. Today, one of our core areas of work is capacity building and training and sharing how digital documentation can be used by local groups to document heritage. However, sometimes in adopting the role of the teacher, we have missed an opportunity to learn from our local partners about the unique challenges as well as the reasons why this heritage matters to them. They are the real experts and it is important that this documentation and meaningful connection occur before a project ever begins, um, on Zoom, for example. Um, this can ensure that we can develop stronger connections and ensure that the work that we do is targeted and more impactful. Without asking questions and attempting to understand local conditions from site managers, there is no way that we can hope the documentation that we provide can solve or help ameliorate any of the problems occurring at the sites. And for these projects to be sustainable, local partners need to understand the processes and the value of the data so it does not sit in a hard drive somewhere. Building relationships take time and we will be rethinking the, our project timescale as well to ensure these projects are not seen as one-off. Thank you very much. Casey, thanks for that great talk about conduct. I think it leads into our next section about responsibilities, which will be addressed by Yumna and Eve. So our first speaker, Yumna Tibet, is an associate project officer at the Arab State Unit of UNESCO's World Heritage Center, where her main focus is the safeguarding of world heritage during conflicts and post-conflict reconstruction and recovery challenges. She's the co-editor of the book, Five Years of Conflicts, The State of Cultural Heritage in the Ancient City of Aleppo, which assessed damages in the city through satellite imagery and was co-published by UNESCO and UNITAR in 2018. She was working as an architect in Lebanon and France before specializing in heritage conservation protection and joining UNESCO in, 20, in 2008. The next speaker after Yumna will be Yves Ubelman. He's been an architect since 2006 and he began his career working in the Middle East and Central Asia, where he carried out surveys of archeological sites using photogrammetry. In 2013, he founded the Iconum Startup, whose mission is to digitize endangered heritage sites around the world to ensure their transmission to future generations. Yumna, would you like to kick off our discussion about responsibilities? Yes, thank you everybody. Thank you for giving me the floor and the opportunity to be with you today. From our perspective as professional working at UNESCO in the field of culture, the protection of the cultural and natural heritage of the world is a shared responsibility. 
It is our mandate to empower key stakeholders in member states to inventory, protect, safeguard, and transmit heritage to future generations. Heritage nurtures a sense of belonging, highlights shared histories, and contribute to sustainable development and the resilience of societies. This heritage faces many risks, including natural disasters, the effect of climate change, armed conflict, deliberate destruction, thefts, not to mention over tourism and degradation over time. In the face of these challenges, digital technologies are fantastic tools that can play an essential role in helping preserve, safeguard, showcase, and promote heritage. They facilitate its restoration, reconstruction, and recovery. Digital technology enhances the identification, documentation, assessment, and scientific and public access. They are useful tools for improving management and monitoring, strengthening international collaboration, education, and community development, and transmission to future generations. Nonetheless, documentation based on digital images is of interest to new generations, enables young people to become aware of the value and great diversity of heritage. In order to transcend our lifetime, it is crucial to collect a high quality of and wide range of digital data and content, create a community of practice around digital technology, and ensure its dissemination to all stakeholders. And that includes, first, defining minimal international standards and guidelines. Some standards already exist, such as the object ID for movable heritage. Some are in the process of creation, so, such as the common standard for the Pan-European Initiative for 3D digitization of cultural heritage artifacts, monuments and sites. The work of updating the ECOMOS principle for an ethical heritage recording is also so relevant. I remember witnessing the scanning of wall painting in a funeral tomb in Sudan that was not open for decades and the extreme care taken by the archaeological mission for a highly reliable recording of color for monitoring purposes and in ensuring that they work would not further impact the place. They also organize visits for the local communities living around the site. Second, gathering and locating existing documentation, archive and studies by involving all relevant fields of expertise having worked on the site or studied living practices. In my experience, for example, we managed to understand that most of the structure of the Citadel of Palmyra that have been destroyed in the recent conflict were not authentic structures, thanks to an old paper report unknown to the national young professionals as more probably lost in time. This report was also really informative about the weaknesses of the Citadel over time allowed clarifying the emergency consolidation requir required to avoid further loss. Three, maintaining close collaboration among the wide range of skilled specialists to identify all sources of data, collaborate in obtaining funding, and avoid the counterproductive overlapping of initiatives. Four, completing inventories, identifying needs and priorities, and the most suitable format and type of contents. A wide diversity of contents and data collection should be considered. Engaging in the process with the collaboration of the communities that are custodians of heritage and envisaging to the largest possible extent the training of national experts while operating abroad. I have mentioned community involvement in Sudan, but I, I can also refer to the empowerment of Syrian professionals in collecting drone imagery, which highly improved their reporting on the state of conservation of World Heritage property during the conflict. Six, ensuring that the digital technology data collection are used both by the general public as an educational and experience-driven tool, as well as experts, communities, and government for research and preservation efforts by proposing some flexibility in the presentation and accessibility of data. Finally, some technicalities need to be taken into account a sufficient and sustainable storage space, the secure hosting of data with carefully, careful consideration of the level and means of access to protect some site from looting, but also to allow institutions that do not have an open access to share content. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here. I will share my screen. Uh, so, okay, so I'm, uh, I'm Yves Bellman, so the founder of uh, Iconem. It's a high-tech startup 
involved in the documentation of uh, heritage at risk. So we try to provide skill and technology to local professionals in uh, Syria, in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, in Libya, or in Yemen, uh, to help them for the documentation of the heritage at risk. So I want to insist uh, on the importance of uh, emergency. I mean, we, we have to do the documentation very quickly uh, uh, on, to be on the field, uh, to uh, collect uh, every detail, every clue of uh, the destruction. Here, uh, just after a trauma or after a destruction. Here we are in, in Palmyra just a few days after the end of uh, the, the battle. Uh, we were on the field with a, with a colleague uh, to make a very accurate mapping of different temples destroyed by Islamic State, but also uh, museums. I, I, I try to... I, this is a museum of, of Palmyra, so we did a, a full mapping. It's like a, 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 a scene of a crime, uh, but it's important to, to, to keep the record of it and for the future generation to, to, to have yeah, this idea of this uh, uh, violence. So we work uh, also at the scale of, of, of the city. And this is a, a recording of Aleppo, just a few weeks after the end of the bombing. And as you may know, you know, the population come back very uh, soon uh, after, uh, 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 you know, a battle or after a war. And they start, you know, cleaning and resto on restoring, you know, a monument and a lot of historical evidence will uh, uh, disappear completely. So that's why this kind of mapping uh, uh, should become, you know, the only trace uh, we can have of some historical monument uh, uh, on, on these places. So at the different scale, I, I think it's really important to keep you know, this uh, record uh, for the uh, future, future uh, generation. And, uh, uh, and this is the same work we did in partnership with uh, UNESCO in, uh, in Aleppo uh, to record every uh, destruction in every area. And I know that today there is a lot of restoration work uh, done on the field, but it's important to keep uh, this, uh, this memory uh, for the future. And keeping the memory is not the only goal uh, we can uh, have on, for, for this documentation. And I think it's very important to bring you know, the voice of this uh, local professional, even in Europe and in America, to raise you know, uh, awareness of the people about the importance of keeping this memory. So this is a kind of event we can do through this digital data. And it's not only like uh, expertise uh, data for experts and for cartography, but it's also data for uh, experiences and uh, to help you know, the society and the political leader uh, to understand you know, the importance of keeping uh, alive uh, this uh, heritage for the future uh, generation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yves. So um, the third topic of uh, the discussion is uh, professional practice uh, delivered data and will be addressed by Elena and Emily. Uh, Dr. Elena Macchioni is an Italian architect and a PhD from Politecnico di Milano. Uh, she has been uh, working uh, as a conservation architect in private practice and as a consultant for public and private organizations since 2019. And she is associate project specialist at the Kennedy Conservation Institute. Uh, Dr. Emily L. Spratt is an art uh, historian, technologist and consultant. As a fellow, at Columbia uh, in the Data Science Institute with sponsorship from the Program in Historic Preservation and the Department of uh, Computer Science, Emily's current research focuses on the philosophical and ethical implications of AI-enhanced technologies for the analysis, generation, and curation of art and architecture. Emily received her PhD from Princeton in uh, Byzantine and uh, Renaissance art and has taught in the Department of Art History and in Preservation Studies at Rutgers. Additionally, Emily has been a strategic advisor on art, technology and ethics for numerous companies, institutions and governments. Uh, Elena, the floor is yours. So, good morning, everyone. 
thanks to the organizers and moderator for your introduction and the panelists for their presentation so far. Uh, I want to start saying that I'm not a heritage recording specialist and therefore I will start from my experience as a conservation professional and most recently as associate project specialist at the GCI where I work with the seismic retrofitting project and Bagan conservation project. Uh, in both of these projects, recording has been carried out as part as a, of a conservation activity in the field. And to, for both of them, we could rely on the collaboration of external consultants in heritage recording, and this ensured the highest level of competence. Um, so it is undeniable that guidelines and standards are essential in the field to provide quality and also accessibility of data by several users over time. Um, I will try to point out some topics for discussion that arise from time and advancement in technology, appropriate quality of data, and balance between future and current needs of the project. And I will do so referring to the mission of the institution and how it has, has shaped my experience. Um, so the GCI works internationally to advance conservation practice and serves the conservation community. And this kind of give a framework to our approach to recording and managing data. So first, the focus on the conservation community implies the idea to develop model projects, keeping in mind the dissemination of results in a way that, of course, must be sensitive to the owners and custodians of the sites. Considering that most of GETI initiatives are long terms, this also means that there is a gap between acquisition and dissemination. And in the meanwhile, the field evolves with advancement in technology and ease of access to novel instrumentation. Um, second, the topic of reinterpretability is crucial and has to be considered when the setting standards. So, being a heritage conservation and multidisciplinary activity, the appropriate method and level of detail for recording may vary enormously. So ideally, we want to make sure that it's possible to reaccess and reprocess data to produce deliverable to fit the needs of diverse professionals involved, such as structural engineers or wall painting conservators. And this is an issue of paramount importance for monitoring and maintenance. For example, for the current work on the Church of Puñotambo in Peru, that is one of the case studies of the seismic retrofitting project. Further down, this is also, there is also the need to pay attention to the conservation community of the future, creating a record for posterity. And all of this has implication in terms of storage space needs and data management. Third and most important, the GCI does not work alone but its projects are usually collaborative endeavors that involve working closely with a local partner. And this means that together with standard and guidelines produced by renowned organizations in the field and the in-house ones set for the institution, in many cases, they need to be project specific. For example, the definition of a glossary of condition to assess the current state of a site in Peru or a workflow workflow for documentation in Myanmar are tailored to the characteristic of the project and to the needs of the partner organization. And this informs all the decision regarding the appropriate software, equipment, technology that are used for activities on site and for training. In fact, the ultimate goal is not only the outcome of that specific model project, but also to define a shared process through a collaboration in a way that is acceptable and sustainable by the partner organization in the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Emily? Well, first of all, I'd like to just say thank you to the organizers of this um, really wonderful and pivotal event, and um, also to praise my brilliant colleagues for all of their comments so far in this discussion. And I just want to note that I'll omit some, uh, some ideas that I had because they have already been uh, spoken of so far. Um, in, my, uh, in, in, in my contribution here, I would like to uh, focus on the language that is inherent to the 1996 um, ECOMOS principles for um, the recording um, of monuments and sites. 
and sort of question this notion of what the archive meant then versus what the archive means now. Many things have changed uh, in our digitally enabled world since 1996, and the concept of the archive has grown greatly to include a multitude of images, images so numerous that they might have even been unimaginable in 1996. And so when you have the possibility for recording monuments with so many images, um, what then is the value of each singular image versus the value of one image defined as a part of a larger constellation of images, and especially when they're amenable to the tools of new technologies um, such as machine learning. So on the other hand, um, on, the one, on the one hand, we have the, mul the multitude of images in the archive, and on the other hand, we have the question of storing these images. And again, going back to the language of the 1996 charter, we talk about the, the concept of what does it mean to be archivally stable? What is a safe archive? What is the archive's environment? How do we make the archive available? This is, this is language from the 1996 document. So what does that mean today when our archive, our concept of the archive has radically shifted? And now when we have this multitude of images that we are likely to increasingly place in the cloud, what does it mean to store something physically, to keep it protected um, on a site, um, which the 1996 charter emphasizes, versus what does it mean to keep it in the cloud, to make it digitally available to everyone, um, to limit access to that, but also to put it in this place which we ourselves in the digital world don't quite yet know how to manage and where you have cybersecurity concerns sort of leading um, uh, developments actually in a lot of cloud computing um, uh, things. So what is the concept of being archivally stable in a cloud computing based world for data management um, what are the roles of technology such as blockchain going to do for the concept of permanence and availability? And what does that mean in terms of the risk benefit comparison of making things available um, versus um, making them also susceptible to things such as attacks or um, possibly uh, changing our notion of the, the limited access to that data uh, based upon the agreements between the various stakeholders. So the very concept of safety in our new digital world and the archival environment is very different than it was in 1996. And um, we, we need to sort of think about how then you can also work to incentivize the, the custodians of our cultural heritage and the ones digitally recording it to essentially work toward this process of um, recording without being too deterred by the potential pitfalls. And this is especially true for the nonprofit area. And so while previously much of the discourse around the custodianship of our world heritage has be, been based upon a very, a, a very curmudgeonly based model of holding our records and not necessarily making them so easily available and limiting their accessibility. What can we do to shift expectations in that regard with the way that our digital world is moving where information is assumed to be accessible and more people want in with the democratic process of how it is that images especially of heritage are discoverable in an online environment how do we incentivize that could we think about changing policies for how it is that monuments are recorded as being a staple for the unesco recognition process that's something to consider and lastly i want to bring up the importance of figuring out standard uh, approaches to confidentiality and fair use agreements around the records which are made about the monuments. 
And this is an area where there really has been um, very little uh, clear guidelines from uh, the point of view of the law, um, such as the recent uh, lawsuit um, launched by uh, Heritage uh, Auctions against Christie's truly demonstrates in sort of the pure victory of the settlement that was reached that what actually is a confidentiality agreement today given the susceptibility for images to be um, gathered unlawfully outside of the terms of that agreement um, in an online space. So how do we work to sort of make progress in this area and does um, our group have an ethical responsibility to possibly um, create a standard document that then um, uh, participants in this could go to as a model for what actually constitutes a confidentiality agreement and a fair use agreement relating to images um, in this space. And by way of conclusion, I would like to remind everyone that the term archive itself uh, relates to the Greek word etymologically, archeion, which has to do with the principles of the law. And I want to emphasize that we have a great responsibility as the ones directing how the contents of that law are then used, accessed, and thought about um, and ultimately disseminated in this world. Um, so thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Emily. I think that that's spurred on so many questions for our next section, and these arguments conclude the first part of our webinar. Following, we have comments and questions from our invited speakers. Michelle Duong will be moderating this section. Thanks, Becca. So in the second part of the webinar, each commentator will address one topic specific question and then the panelists will have a total of five minutes to answer. With us today are Professor Alex Yan, Professor Andreas Georgopoulos, Dr. Mechtil Drossler, and Professor Mona Hess. Alex Yan is a professor in the Department of Architecture, University of Technology, Taipei, Director of the Center for Cultural Sites Rehabilitation and Development, and SIPA Vice President. <laughs> Mechtel Rossler is the current director of the UNESCO World Heritage Center. Mona Hess is professor for D digital technologies in heritage conservation at the University of Bamberg and a UCL honorary senior research associate. And Andreas Georgopoulos is a photogrammetry professor at the Department of Rural and Sur Survey Engineering at the National Techn Technical University of Athens and SIPA vice president. Thank you all for joining us today. Let's start with Alex. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. I'm Alex Yen from Taiwan. Uh, I'm uh, also Vice President of SIPA. It's my great honor to join this event. Um, I devote myself uh, the heritage conservation for from a cultural aspect for nearly 40 years and uh, closely involved in the field of digital cultural heritage in recent 20 years. Since then, I keep figuring out the following issues, which are very basic issues, but uh, I think it's very important. Firstly, what are the purpose, purposes of digital culture heritage? In general, the digital documentation has to establish a good relationship with the conservation needs, whereas, how to make the digital outcome in use of the conservation or let the conservators can clearly express their demand on digital still struggles, such as recently in the field of so-called heritage BIM, HBIM, the communication between the digital and the cultural aspects needs a clear guideline to fill the gaps. Secondly, the data acquisition is always focused on high definition and high accuracy, which is from the uh, technical point of view. However, while during the uh, conversion storage, 
and the practical usage, such as make a model for different purposes. The high accuracy, the dense data, are often forced to proceed with the downgrade, unfortunately, and make possible lose its authenticity. Are there any way we can deal with this situation? Thirdly, we are calling to uh, openness or free for use the data or the information. But in relation to the value-added application, the principles in ethical and the physical between the information owners and the users has to be considered. To sum up, while we consider revising the standards, it should be include not only technical, but also the ethical guideline for various professionals. Thank you. That's my point. Thank you, Alex. Did any of the panelists want to address this one? Eves, perhaps? Uh, yes, if you want, uh, just, um... Alors, I think I, I, I tried to, to put my video, but I don't know why it's not working. But can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, so just I I I, I can uh, reply the, the question of uh, the purposes of uh, this uh, this work indeed, and I think uh, there is different purposes. Uh, the first one is assessment, and assessment is important. And when you are working like in remote places where nobody can go or few people only can go. It's important, you know, to give a wide access uh, to uh, accurate dat data to help, you know, worldwide experts to understand what's going on on the field. And I think the documentation is first a, a good tool, uh, you know, to help uh, a wider commun community, specialist community, to understand exactly uh, the process of destruction, for example. And so this is the first uh, purpose. The second one uh, should be uh, uh, for uh, the architect or the, for, for the restoration of the sites. I mean, the first step, uh, uh, the first step is, is to understand what's going on and the assessment and, and, and the, the, the destruction itself. And the second one is uh, what can we do? Uh, uh, should we uh, restore uh, the monument? Uh, have we enough element for that? For example, for, for Palmyra, it wasn't clear. It's still not really clear if we can, you know, rebuild uh, the monument with the, with the stone itself. And there is an important de debate, and it's important for this debate, you know, to have enough uh, information uh, to see what, what is possible. And for example, we did a, 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 um, a little study on the arch, the monumental arch, and with the 3D model, we were able to, to recreate in 3D every blocks, every element of, uh, of the arch, and see that uh, we had uh, a lot of elements that can be rebuilt uh, for, for this arch. But it wasn't the case for the Temple of Bell, for example. And thanks to the documentation, in, it, it was, uh, we were able to 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 have this uh, this uh, this information. So I think for remote places, uh, it's the document. The purpose of documentation is very clear because it's so important to involve a worldwide community of experts uh, to think about you know uh, the uh, best uh, solution for 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 the restoration of the future of this 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 kind of monument. Um, I, I just want to jump in here and say that I'm, I'm very happy that the question of authenticity came up. And um, I, I want to emphasize that uh, a digital recording is still, um, is still not a replacement for the real thing. It's something um, in and of itself. And for that reason, I think, again, we have to go back to the original charter and think about what then 
are the rules of the game for the text-based description of the monument and to put emphasis on the verbal description of what we are recreating and, and showing uh, digitally with the images. Um, but I'm really happy that authenticity came up here. Great. Thank you. Um, next we have Mechtild Rossler. Thank you very much and it's a great pleasure for me uh, to join uh, the discussion here. I'm uh, speaking here from the World Heritage Center uh, based in Paris and I'm also glad about uh, this debate. It was really excellent with a number of young professionals. I'm also happy about the discussion on authenticity for me, authenticity and integrity are key components of the outstanding universal value and um, I learned a lot from your exchanges because um, the data has changed so much over time. I work 30 years now on World Heritage and you know when we started we didn't have computers here in UNESCO so you can imagine what has changed over time and what has changed so rapidly especially and that was mentioned also by Eve and by Yumna uh, with the intentional destruction uh, which we have been facing in a number of uh, conflicts, uh, especially in the Mi Middle East, where recording then became a really a tool also for recovery and for the identity of people. Now, um, I really think I would like to ask one question to the panel, which is, uh, in the, your view, how do you think, um, what is the key factor that would allow the local communities to use technologies to better conserve their World Heritage Sites? Thank you. Thank you, Mathilde. Um, Elena, did you want to take this one? Yes, yes, I was gonna unmute myself. Um, so I would say that the key factor, I would imagine part of it, it, it may be training and ease of access to technology. And this is something that can be done. But one thing that I pointed out in my presentation, I think is also a matter of who's providing this training to kind of downsize their expectation and provide something that is kind of usable. And this is an issue that I think we had in several projects. So sometimes you have kind to find a compromise between what is the quality and the result that you want to get and what are like the financial human resources, time constraints of the community or the owner of the site or the custodians of the site. So I would say it's also a matter of finding a compromise. Thank you, Helena. Um, did anybody else want to answer to this one? I just want to say that I think that there's a tremendous opportunity here with education um, and th there's a way to empower local communities by getting them interested in the past and their identity, but framing it in a way that they're preparing for the future. And since so much of the future is based upon building digital skills, that it's, it's really a perfect opportunity to kind of blend aspirations um, in the area of STEM with also local and community-based knowledge. So I'm really excited for different potential opportunities that are there to come. And I know, I know Eve actually has um, some thoughts on this too. I'm, I'm wondering if he could maybe weigh in too. Maybe I could jump in really quickly um, and just say that I think like nowadays, like with photogrammetry being more accessible to people and that um, individuals are able to use even their cell phones to document places. And I think really it's about like having these conversations early in the process with each of these groups. Like what I found at working at SIRC is understanding we learn so much more by having this dialogue in the beginning on how they can use the data they actually have a lot more to say like these local stakeholders on how, ideas of how they can do monitoring programs or understand and so i think training definitely but um in all aspects on how to use the data on how to document um but as well like understanding having those conversations in the beginning to understand how how what they're looking for specifically and how um digital documentation can help in some of their projects that they're doing thank you casey not sure yeah if i mean if I, if 
Uh, sorry, if I could come in there as well. Um, just to say that I think, I think one of the great phrases there was this idea of downsizing expectations because um, I mean, one of the things that Casey and I found now that we're doing some, some uh, analysis of, of our last project, the Heritage on the Edge, was it wasn't just a question of whether or not some people had access to data, it was a question of whether some people had access to the project at all. Um, in some parts of the world. And I think we have to be very prepared. And I think it links back into Alex's first point, which is the connection between what is the purpose of digital heritage and this question of data acquisition and high accuracy, um, which is that we need to be very aware of getting the balance right, um, that, that data has to be accessible, that what we produce has to actually be usable outside of just the developed world. Thank you, Will. All very great points. Um, did anybody else want to jump in on this one before we move to Mona? Okay, Mona, go ahead. Um, hello, everybody. Um, this uh, has uh, my question and my remark is very much connected to previous remarks that have been made, especially by Elena, who is training the people um, who are going to do the digital uh, recording. And um, my question really uh, relates to um, this sentence that says um, in the 96 um, text it says adequate skills and knowledge and awareness um, of associated tasks need to be uh, given if someone is documenting heritage. So really um, we as academics here we have the stewardship of these the new generation with a new profile coming up really to educate them and I think here in Bamberg in Germany we do um, have a very educated uh, try in developing new programs for education. There is a very worked out educational program for heritage conservatives that is running here in Bamberg for the past 25 years. But how are we educating the new um, profiled, uh, new generation, excuse me, new generation um, of professionals? And very often these days, the scanners remain with one button only. And when you come into a place to document them is that the technician is already here. But what I want to say is it's not a trivial um, undertaking. There is um, basics of engineering metrology involved here. Um, there really um, is the need to educate a responsible professional that knows about heritage conservation and development technologies as well. So I would like to know from the panelists um, how you would approach a very good um, develop, uh, educational development um, and maybe program for these new professionals. Thank you, Mona, that's a very great question. Uh, do we have any panelists who want to take that on? Uh, Michelle, I can I can just make a quick a quick comment on that as somebody who does actually try and, and train people in this. I think there are uh, two aspects, um, one of which is the training and the technical side of things, and I think that can very much depend on your student uh, base. Um, I know where I come from, students tend to come from the more social sciences and the technical things can be difficult for them. But I think an, an, another side um, is thinking about the softer side of this, which we've touched on a lot today, um, specifically about why we are doing what we're doing. And, and just imparting into students the importance of, I mean, this conversation is about ethics, of, of making sure that what are we doing with this data? How are we using it? Are we using it responsibly? Are we working with people to ensure that we're co-creating and we're working the data um, together with other people? Um, so, uh, I mean, that's far from suggesting a syllabus in any way, but it's just thinking about this in two ways, one of which being the ethics of it and the other which being how we actually do it. Um, what, one um, comment I'd like to make is that I think we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. There are already established fields that are dealing with different aspects of this very well. Um, architecture, the history of art, computer science, um, and historic preservation um, more specifically. So I think that the answer might lie in partnerships between, between the fields and getting there to be more uh, uh, cross-field collaboration and discussion. I think we need to rely on what has already been established and uh, what, we, what we can learn from um, the, the, the separate disciplines once they are brought together. 
I, I, I agree completely with that point about involving different groups. And I think also like reevaluating the time scale of like training efforts and kind of instead of like one or two weeks, I think the Getty has done a really good job on having these really long term projects where you're training not just one group, like you're involving universities and you're involving architects and, and people that are involved in the site management. So I, I really wholeheartedly agree that like the training process can't just live with one entity because people leave organizations. And so it has to be like institutional knowledge that kind of is shared throughout a community so that you do have like kind of the sustainability built into this training program. Yes, I agree. And also um, in reference to Mathilde's question, in order to uh, share this information um, and to understand how it can be used and offer that value to communities by educating them, they can also learn um, what is being gathered and if that can adequately serve them or how they can use that information to contribute to their own communities because a concern is also access to the technology and to the internet so one needs to be cognizant about uh, what happens in between that transformation um, from physical to digital and how to make sure that that is still accessible and i guess what is lost in the translation of that information, um, what would be acceptable um, for each community and uh, how that can serve them. Thanks so much, Julie. Great questions and answers so far. Next we have Andreas. I see you. Go ahead. Okay, thanks uh, very much. Uh, and uh, I have to, I would like to congratulate the uh, emerging professionals of SIPA and all the organizers. And thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'll try to be uh, quite uh, quick and concise. Uh, and I call all of you to, to imagine that uh, what we are discussing is, is a, a stellar system. And the, uh, the sun is cultural heritage. And around it, we have some satellites and we have some planets like the owners and the custodians, or the conservation and uh, the uh, restoration experts. And we have the recording specialists. And we have, of course, data. And this is something produced when we, let's say, record uh, cultural heritage. And after processing the data, we uh, get some information. So it's not just data, it's processing the data and getting some information. So it's, it's a very valuable uh, asset, what we produce. Some of these planets, of course, uh, may clash to one another. And my question is uh, centered on, on one of these clashes. And um, is, uh, to put it bluntly, who owns the data? And should anybody own the data? I mean, now we are talking about, uh, nowadays we are talking about open access and everything is free and everything is available to the public and we have internet and we have access to the data. And if somebody is able to process that data and produce some kind of information that is quite different from what we think that the information should come out of this data, why shouldn't we uh, give to that person this, this opportunity. So ownership of the data uh, and uh, being, being uh, the data free, I think this is something that uh, is not very easily answered. And uh, of course we know that there are uh, laws. I mean, there is a European law which, which is uh, by short called PSI, Public Service Information. And every information or, or every piece of data that is produced uh, using taxpayers' money should be freely available. So that goes also for cultural heritage uh, recordings. Okay, so scan, uh, scans or images or whatever that we have uh, discussed. So my, my question is, should there be an owner of the data or the data should be freely available? And I would expect uh, an answer mainly from those who think they own the data. So it's, it's the archaeologist side, the custodians. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yumnev, go ahead. 
Yes, um, well, it's a really interesting question and it uh, raised a difficult point. And in our, all our meetings, when we comes to the dis discussion about uh, documentation, we face this question of uh, the use of the data, the availability, the open access. And um, when it comes in to our uh, involvement as contracting some um, companies that would do some work on the sites, of course, as UNESCO, we uh, make sure that uh, the Direction of Antiquities, the Institutes of Heritage, the Ministries of Culture have access to the, the data that have been um, collected as custodian of the site and responsible uh, entities in charge. And uh, uh, what we think is really, really important when we cannot you know, give full open access to the data is to be able to locate the data and know who which institution owns it so um, when the time time comes where there's a project on the site then we know uh, towards which institution we need to 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 move and 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 request the data and make it available at least for some purposes um, with their agreement so this is what I can say. Uh, I, I think we have a very important uh, responsibility as organization for a special kind of data. I mean the data of sites that are disappearing or that are not uh, really easily accessible. And I think that this data should be released uh, to uh, many people because, because the site is not uh, easily accessible. So. For this data, uh, I think it's sometimes difficult because you have to negotiate, you know, with local authority to, to be able, you know, to, to release this data publicly. And sometimes it, it won't work because uh, local authority is not uh, so uh, um, happy to, to, to release very soon this data. They prefer to, to wait a little bit because the situation on the field is not so clear. Or, but I think it's a very important responsibility in a long term. Uh, 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 in, in a long term, but the accessibility of the data requires also uh, uh, complex technology. Huh? Uh, by internet, you need to to have uh, I don't know uh, like a visualization tool, download tools. So this required for us, for example, like a company required a lot of engineering. So it's not uh, 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 often really easy to, to make this uh, accessibility. But I should, I, I think that some organization like ECOMOS, like uh, UNESCO can, you know, really uh, take this, uh, this, uh, uh, this topic and maybe uh, create like a common depository for, for all, of, all of us. Um, I, I'd like to just take a stab at this too, and I'll say something um, maybe a little bit controversial, which is that if we if we agree that our world heritage is a shared heritage that everyone should have access to, then why should it be the case that that wouldn't be the same for digital access too? So in that regard, I I am for open access to the visual information of these sites. But I think that that also comes with the responsibility to recognize who has recorded that information um, and what that information means with text-based descriptions as well. But there's something very different between the notion of open access versus fair use. And so, well, maybe we could move to a paradigm of allowing open access. How can we responsibly manage the use of these images? Because what we don't want to have happen is perhaps uh, a situation where there's the unfair commercialization of a particular site where there might be different religious sensitivities, for example, about how that data might be used. So how do we then sort of uh, change our approach in this regard. And again, I, I want to um, go back to the role of creating a standard sort of confidentiality and fair use agreement 
for um, anyone who wants to partake in the, um, the use of that data, whether it be for educational purposes or even for commercial ones. How do we then negotiate those relationships and should they be negotiated through contracts and how enforceable are those contracts given the lack of legislation on copyright issues related to the art world? Thanks. Thank you, Emily. Will? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come in on the other side actually there. Um, it's just that I don't think one size fits all here. It's lovely to think that uh, everybody should have access to the data, but the truth is that everybody doesn't have access to the data. Uh, predominantly people in the developed first world have access to the data and most other people in the world do not. I also don't think we can have a one size fits all because there are different value systems at different sites. And I think that we talked regularly throughout the panel about the importance of dialogue and conversation with the custodians of the site, that is the local communities who look after these sites. Um, and now we're talking about giving access to everybody without really maybe even discussing it with them. And I think there will be many situations where perhaps for historical reasons or other reasons, um, site custodians or people might not feel comfortable in the sharing of their heritage or at least a kind of simulacra of their heritage um, more widely. So I, I just think that we need to be aware, and I, I think a lot of this comes down to the different value systems we have around authenticity as well. Um, um, and just being sympathetic to the fact that, like the NARA statement would say, you know, that a lot of these things can be local. We need to be aware of that. Thank you, Will. Julie? Yes, and I think um, in that awareness, uh, there's also many degrees. And I think that there's a way in which we can, um, I guess, hope and strive to develop that trust by making some information available. But I guess to what limits and what constraints those exist has yet to be decided. But I'm of the hope that um, we can develop that trust and security by permitting and allowing people to share. And hopefully that will be an invitation for more contrib contributions. Thank you, Julie, and thank you to all the commentators. Those were excellent questions. Great discussion um, with the panelists. And we're going to shift into Q&A to continue this discussion. And Dr. Mario Santana will moderate this section. So just a reminder to put your questions in the Q&A option and upvote any questions that you'd like. Go ahead, Mario. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you all for the interesting interventions and discussion. Um, just to remind everyone that we are recording this and this will be available, so it will be a great source to get more uh, discussion uh, going on. So we have 11 questions. Let's see if we can get to all the questions of the audience. So the first question comes from A.G. Creek, and he says his work focuses on presenting and locations for using education and accessibility for those with disabilities. Is anything being done along those lines to open up access to people for those purposes, presenting sites, histories, and locations? And I would probably ask Casey to comment on this. If you feel like, of course. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's something that we've kind of started to think more about, um, making just kind of simple things like looking to see if our website is accessible. Um, there are certain roles in the United States, I think it differs by country on like um, the, the colors, like if it's for visually impaired people on certain things on the website. So it's just simple things that I think you can do. And I think we're starting to think about projects like that we have audio versions of things, making our website and the way that we present the materials, again, for storytelling as well, like making sure that there are other options for displaying that material. And so I think in projects going forward, that's kind of a way that we're focusing on. Um, and as well as like in the United States, at least there are like certain grants that we've received where there are requirements on that the data must be presented in, in a certain way that is accessible to people. And so especially on those projects where we're making sure that, that the data is visible um, or accessible to people in that way. So I think, I think it's probably very different for a country. Let's, someone else jump in there as well that knows a little bit more. Okay, thank you, Casey. Uh, let's go to the second question and then we can answer and then people can jump in. So Adolfo Ibanez from Book Rio in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil says, uh, referral to worldwide digitalization projects. Any thoughts about the use of three digitalization projects for digital preservation and integration with preservation systems inside, inside the responsible management bodies? And I was thinking uh, to ask actually if 
to, to answer this question. Sorry, uh, so, so the question is about so you, uh, the, uh, sorry, can you repeat, Mayo? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't edit the questions. So basically, uh, what Adolfo is asking, if there is any thoughts about how to integrate 3D into the preservation or conservation systems for the management of, of sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a te technical question, but uh, now we have a lot of possibility, you know, to integrate uh, a full, even very complex and uh, accurate uh, uh, 3D data into uh, data management tools. And it, it's interesting to, to, to see also the new possibility of, of it and how it can help, you know, people uh, to, to manage uh, the site itself. And what is interesting, we have uh, uh, currently um, an experiment in uh, Cambodia in Angkor, and the idea is to make every uh, month uh, with uh, the people of, uh, of uh, Angkor, uh, the people of uh, Apsara, it's, uh, it's an organization who, 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 are, uh, um, who are working on uh, um, Angkor. Uh, we are doing a database in 3D. Uh, to assess, you know, uh, the evolution of uh, the, the temples and also uh, the erosion of it. And step by step, we are building like a, a full 3D database. It's not really like uh, expensive. It's just, you know, uh, a team of three people who are doing this every every week. They are taking picture and the picture is integrating integrated it into a database. And the database is available to the to to the team. To, uh, and every uh, every yes, you can come come back on, on the same sites and overlap, you know, uh, the data. So you can see through the time, you know, the evolution of, for example, the vegetation, and you can see the growth of uh, of uh, of the vegetation, and you can uh, choose, you know, uh, the the emergency uh, and the for for the restoration and for the cleaning uh, on the site. So. I think that very naturally, uh, step by step, it's easy, you know, to include inside, you know, uh, this uh, politic of, uh, of uh, uh, restoration of the site and managing of the site, you know, uh, the 3D uh, methodology, even with a low technology. Now you ju just have to use, you know, cameras and maybe some easy drones to pilot, you know, and help, you know, the local team to do it by, by, by itself. So I think it will be a very interesting revolution for the next few years. Thank you, Yves. Uh, so the next question, it comes from Rashmi Gajare. Uh, with various organizations working in the field of digital documentation, what are the efforts taken to avoid duplicating data and recording the same sites. This also speaks to the accessibility to digital data and copyright issues. And I think Emily could, could give us a hint on this. Well, one thing I would just uh, say right away, um, sort of to question um, the person asking the question, is that um, do we really consider an image, any image of a site taken at a different point in time to be wholly different? I think that's sort of working, the, the question is based upon the assumption that the digital, that, that the heritage site in itself is sort of an immutable concept. And that when we record it, that we're also capturing that immutability. But um, all of us working in this field know all too well that monuments are uh, living things. Um, they corrode, they're restored, they're subjected to all sorts of um, uh, things related to natural elements or maybe even uh, civil unrest. So the, the idea of the stability of the monument, I think, is, um, is one that we should not take for granted. And actually having lots of different images of the same site from different times is a great way to actually keep track of its state of preservation. So I would actually encourage there in terms of the um, 
uh, the maintenance process that uh, UNESCO goes through, why not have a, um, a principle which would then say after X amount of time, a monument needs to be re-photographed in order to compare how it has shifted from previously. And this keeps a good sort of track record of its um, deterioration or restoration progress and so on and so forth. So um, I, I'm for lots of different images and don't think that any photograph of a monument is necessarily going to be the same as one, even if it was taken in the, in the exact same spot. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for your answer. Uh, now we go to Kamiar Kamiap, a friend of ours from the UAE. So it's understandable that during and after a conflict, such as wars or earthquakes, documentation is must be done. Uh, what is the next stage of documentation? State parties and local communities remove the remains and start conservation or something else. How can that documentation would help? What is the rule? And I, I think that Jumla, Jumla wanted to answer this question. Yes, I want to answer this question. I take this opportunity also to talk about the duplication of activities in times of our conflicts, because after emergency, we really need to act in um, in, in a um, concise manner and go and, and use the most of the funds we have in a difficult situation. And what we um, try to do at UNESCO is really to put uh, all experts and archeological missions and institution who worked on the site on, or in the country around the same table to uh, open discussions and share information about uh, the, the, the documentation they have, the work they undertook uh, at the sites, the project, and, uh, and, um, and then try to establish um, an, an, a, a roadmap for activities so everybody's informed of each other activity and can also network in case there's common interests. And uh, when it comes to uh, emerge uh, also destruction during conflicts, uh, there's uh, several types of documentation. We have, of course, the emergency documentation that uh, if Ubelman was able to take just at the time uh, Palmyra was liberated, so it really captured uh, the state of the site at the time um, uh, when, when before activity would, would be undertaken for its recovery. And um, this is really important to keep the memory of the site and of the site events that are part of the history of the site. But there's also uh, another type of documentation that needs to be undertaken. It's uh, a thorough documentation of the debris to analyze also uh, their structures and uh, understand if those debris or those stones can be used. And also the, the emergency documentation would then also um, inform of the position of those debris that uh, can also give some information of the position and where it stands in the in the monuments. So there is a need to document uh, thoroughly the debris and then to understand which debris can be used again. And and there's plenty of steps. I mean, it's uh, the recovery is such a long process, and. Um, and, and, and this frame of action for we, what we try to do at UNESCO, to, it's really to look at each site, put, um, uh, open the dialogue with the experts and understand the situation and the, the step forward uh, for a slow recovery that will include, of course, uh, several studies, decision taken, priorities the highlighted by state parties and so on. Thank you. Uh, I think that Will wanted to jump into this question. Oh yeah, no, actually it was, it was the previous question and I think Emily really nailed the response on it. I thought it was brilliant. Um, but one of the things I work in is the area of climate change where it is in fact the very subtle changes and sometimes quite drastic changes that you want to record. And rather than thinking about uh, capturing a, a static image or something, which uh, as Emily said, probably doesn't really exist, um, it is actually integrating multiple uh, ca data capture into the process of monitoring and conservation, which is important. Um, um, and so, uh, you know, thinking about this as being an, on, an ongoing process, especially in the area of climate change and, and trying to democratize that process as widely as possible so that we can monitor as much as possible. Thank you, Will. Uh, we are now going to a tough question. So Miguel Crisendis 
Uh, so we want this idea of making documentation free and open source available to all via the internet. To make something free for anyone to download on the internet is to allow anyone to own the narrative and to create the object that is online. This can be problematic when people who are antagonistic to culture being represented in an object can use it, the object to denigrate that cultural group. For example, putting a digitized Black Lives Matter site online for anyone to download my allow white supremacists to cop these images. I can definitely imagine a white supremacist creating a video game that includes the destruction or defacement of these sites and coupling them with violent images. Curation and interpretation by both responsible and irresponsible parties are a huge part of how we perceive these objects via digital documentation. How do we address this issue with respect to free and open source access? And I was thinking of Julie, because he li she likes to answer uh, tough questions. Yes, I thought this question was interesting because I have a, a question back where I'm wondering, would we not be contributing to that same degree of control by starting to make decisions for others as to um, what is responsible, what is irresponsible, and how we do that? Who is in charge of making those decisions? And I guess, um, I think that there's ways that we can mediate that, but I think that it's also um, important to trust and recognize and hope that, you know, we can transcend certain um, malicious and negative things. I mean, look at the internet, for instance, there's all kinds of stuff that happens there. We are not in control and able to actually limit that, but we can also see thrive with some wonderful positive elements that I think are um, worth considering that value and um, also trusting that people will be able to dismiss and um, uh, in general, we don't want to cultivate things that are bad or malicious. And so I'd like to encourage, maybe there's a way again with degrees that we can encourage this to be a positive environment and develop that trust. Thank you, Julie. Uh, so Yumna, you, you wanted to talk about this and then Casey. Yes. Yes, very briefly, um, I want to flag that we have the responsibility to record and keep uh, documentation, to, but um, providing access of all documentation to all uh, levels of audiences is quite sensitive uh, sometimes. So we have to be careful of the level of access we provide and to, the, to which public it, it is provided. And as, okay. as, as I, we said, I mean, uh, it's clear that providing too many elements on, on, a, on, a, on an archaeological site in a country that is in conflict is a, an open door to, uh, to, to, to illicit trafficking. So we have during those periods to be very extremely careful. Thank you, Casey. And then we go to Emily. Yeah, I think um, what was mentioned previously like, by Will about like the, the fact that the decision should remain with the, the site manager or the authority or or maybe sometimes it's the collector. So we're working on a, a project at SIRC right now called Map the Moment, which is um, having volunteers throughout the country document these ephemeral signs of the Black Lives Matter movement. And really like because they're sensitive in nature for this same kind of reason, we're leaving the decision on whether or not that data is published with the collector and the community that they're they're working with. And so I think I think degrees is a great idea, like maybe one of these Creative Commons licenses that were presented maybe earlier in previous, uh, like, like making it available except for commercial purposes. And so there's way, but, but people could choose to disregard that. And so I think um, you're never safe on the internet um, with what you put out there. And um, I think those decisions um, should lie with the people that are the community that the, that, that represents um, because sites have different spiritual significance or significance to other communities that we need to be mindful of. So uh, it's a complicated, it's a really good question, I think. Thanks. Thank you, Casey. Emily. Yeah, I, I just want to um, to, to thank uh, the uh, participant who made that excellent question as well, um, and, and my colleagues for their excellent responses too so far. Um, I just want to say that I, I really think that a lot of times misinformation is the result of there being a lack of information about maybe the historical significance of something. And I think that what what we really need to recognize is that all of us that are academics in the history of art, in the history of architecture, and in historic preservation, that we absolutely have a responsibility 
to help guide these discussions. And I think that there is an overwhelming lack of leadership in how it is that monuments are interpreted right now. I think that's what's missing. And with someone, some organization, I won't say which one, maybe sort of guiding um, the process of this, I think that um, we should have faith in the public to look to sort of the custodianship of that information when it is curated in the right way. And, um, and that there may be maybe less worse things will happen, or at least then proper steps can be taken to mitigate them once there has been a professional uh, discussion of what these things are in the first place. So I really encourage everyone in these fields to uh, contribute and to get active in describing these sites and uh, starting this discussion. But I think it needs to come from uh, the perspective of a leadership one. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. Um, we're going to pass to, to another topic and, and I apologize for this. It's only a matter of time because we have a two hours uh, time frame for the webinar. So Sara Aluichi from Algeria is asking, uh, in the framework of scientific research, can the choice of heritage documentation, older tools or less developed than 3D documentation, uh, be justified in the case of third world countries in relation to the average level of current technological advances in those countries. And I thought Elena could give it a try. Yes, um, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, I, I totally think so. I think, first of all, we, I mean, we have to consider what we want to document and what is the better technology and methodology to do so, taking into consideration uh, the site itself and who is doing the documentation. And I think also, I mean, the, the quality of data that you can acquire can still be enough according to the purpose that you want to achieve. But also one thing that I want to mention is the fact that technology is continuously advancing. So I'm just thinking about like how photogrammetry is so easy now. So you can even get a, a very um, accurate photogrammetry with, mm, I mean, a much simpler um, equipment. So I think this is just something that is going to improve and make uh, documentation always easier and more accessible to everybody. Thank you, Leda. So we have Dan Acevedo, a curatorial assistant at the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology. Uh, and this question goes to Casey uh, regarding the subjectivity in data recording. How do we minimize our subjectivity in recording? Many sites throughout the world are large enough that recording the entirety of the site would require an excessive amount of time, effort, and potentially manpower. Similarly, there are parts of sites that are so minimally preserved that there is very little to preserve or to glean from remnants, or is this subjectivity acceptable? Wow. Yeah, I think this is a great question. I think um, something that I mentioned in my talk earlier is like involving our stakeholders much. I don't know something about this pandemic that is that has come clear is like Zoom is such a like a a, a tool that you can use to begin those discussions with site managers and local communities months before you ever go out in the field. I think maybe that's one good thing to take away from from this pandemic is that like it is really easy to get people on the phone and and to begin those discussions and understand like local 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 conditions um again they're the experts they know what's happening it's, it's like the example i was saying like we should we should have talked to those farmers in bangladesh that were living right around the archaeological site because they know better than anyone else like what's happening with flooding what's happening with salinization at those places and so um will and i a couple months later after the project we we talked to our partners and like who did we miss talking to and and who should we have involved much earlier on in the process and so i think um Again, like for projects, like there's limited amount of time that people have to be out in the field and so you can't document everything. And so having those conversations to understand exactly where, if it's erosion or some kind of changes occurring and, 
and what kind of what the sites want to understand and so to what they want to glean from the data the utility that they want to derive from it i think having those conversations and engaging in really meaningful dialogue that that takes years it's not something that can happen um just a few weeks or a few months like you need to build those relationships get people comfortable with you if you're coming in as an outsider to understand what's really important and how to focus and, and make the project more impactful Thank you, Casey. Uh, I'm going to jump to Gracia Tucci. Uh, she is asking the panelists in general, uh, the protection of the image and of the data of a cultural asset. The use of, an, of the image, according to the Italian legislation, is subject to concession. In Italy in 2017, there was an order from the civil court that prohibited the illicit use for advertisement purposes or for profit of the image. Since we can now have 3D copies, very faithful to the original, what will prevent the legal use of digital data and how to combine the need for open data and the use of profit for the same data so anybody who wants to answer this question i'll just say one, one small thing that um it, it's difficult because each country has different rules about this and so um i'm not uh, I, I think it might be for our group, it might be useful to have a kind of uh, document which would then state sort of the ideals about that relationship. But um, actually, this really varies from country to country. Um, so uh, some, some countries are, are more developed and sensitive about this than others. Um, at least in the United States, things are, are uh, still getting worked out, you could say, from a legislative standpoint. And even lawsuits that have traditionally sort of guided this, um, this area um, are often overturned. So there's, there's a, a lack of uniformity, and it would be great if there was more uniformity. Thank you. And uh, just to say to everyone that if we don't, if I don't get to your question, uh, we will be having an uh, answers after the after the webinar that will be sent to all the participants to the webinar. So let's go to Ana Paula Rivero de Araujo. It's a member of the Documentation Scientific Committee of ICOMOS Brazil. And she's talking about metadata. So the ethics of documentation in dealing with metadata. How did you see the dissemination of the metadata nowadays? Because information about heritage documentation in Brazil is not fully accessible. Metadata doesn't exist at all. And I think this, this talks to the to the is issue of uh, longevity and provenance information. So I was thinking maybe if you wanna take this question. Yes, yes, I think there is, uh, there is a danger of the inflation of uh, metadata. I think uh, it's very easy to build, you know, very complex uh, uh, database uh, that can be uh, usable for the people. And I think there, there is two very important points. We have to keep uh, track of uh, uh, the location of the images and the time of the Im images. I think th this is the base. If we have both of this information, we can then recreate more information from that. But the, the danger now in some cases and some de databases to have a so complex uh, system that is not possible to use for uh, many people. So. Uh, my advice is to keep, you know, these two important information for the 3D, for the images, and uh, then after, from this information, we can uh, uh, go forward and, and, and go further and, and, and have more, uh, more detail in partnership with experts, with uh, archaeologists, with architects. Thank you, Yves. So we have Wendy Rose, who's a graduate intern at the Getty Conservation Institute, a wall painting conservator, and she's asking, many of you acknowledge in your talks that there is a decision being made or inherent limitation on resolution of capture when recording cultural heritage. However, in the field of cultural heritage documentation, one often sees the language stating that a heritage fact has been totally captured or saved or preserved when it is digitally recorded without any an obvious mention of the resolution of capture. Do you think that going forward, any ethical documentation project should clearly advertise the special resolution of capture of the documentation project in order to improve the understanding that the documentation is not a copy and that all important details might not have been clearly captured? And who wants to answer this? <laughs> Tough question. Ah, Andreas wants to ask, uh, answer. Yeah, oh, it's okay, Andreas, you can go. 
If I may, if I may. Of course, uh, you may. Thank you very much, Mario. Uh, one thing that uh, we didn't touch upon is that uh, digital documentation or digital recording is not with capital letters and bold preservation or conservation or whatever we think or what is uh, rightly mentioned by Wendy Rose, uh, as I see the, the question. So the, the fact that we document something, even in 3D and in, in very high resolution and in, in, in every detail with high resolution images and with the best of the best scanners or whatever, and all the, the experts that are um, processing the data, this by no means is conservation. It's just an image of the, the piece of cultural heritage at that moment. And if that, that piece, the real piece is lost, damaged or whatever, then there's no way that the digital documentation might preserve it. So we shouldn't be uh, living in a dream, okay? It's a different thing. Digital documentation it, uh, provides a basis for curators, for people who take care of cultural heritage to do something to preserve it, but it's not pre preservation itself. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, so now we only have five minutes for uh, the remaining questions. So I'm going to go to Hector Avarca Torres. He says, thank you for your contributions. I would like to know about examples where the community custodian have been involved in the recording process, activities like an open house or an engagement of local elementary schools. Any follow-up process to these activities in developed and lesser developed communities? And I was thinking of Casey to give it a try. Yeah, I think uh, there's been a, a range of different ways that we've engaged with local communities. I think um, the Rapa Nui example that we worked at, we've been working at for three years. And so in that example, we've, we've done documentation or capacity building workshops where we focused on capture, some that have focused on the processing of the data. Um, and really in our discussions with Will, like following the Heritage on the Edge project around climate change, um, that was one of the places where internet access on the island is, is not great. And so they are unable to, to actually view the webpage where Heritage on the Edge is located. And I think to have real engagement with that community, like you know, there needs to be more local events. And so we've done some of those where we are working with schools. I think there needs to be kind of a, a tailored approach and, and what would, again, conversations with groups to see like what would be meaningful to to them as far as like engagement with whether they're interested in, in the documentation work, if they're interested in understanding maybe some methodologies or protocols that they, maybe if they're not interested in, in doing the documentation work themselves, but they have external groups coming in the future, maybe they wanna have like a checklist of things to ask um, for different groups. And so kind of having those conversations to see what they're interested in and what impact is for them um, really will ensure the success of our project going forward. But I think, yeah, it needs to be tailored to both the technological and interests of each group that we work at. Thank you, Casey. Uh, so Max uh, from Bamberg University, he's offering to provide some, uh, uh, he has been doing a, a thorough research of ethical principles and he finds most of them to be too far too detailed. So he's been offered to provide some of his research and, and, and kindly accept that. Uh, let me go to another question. So James Madigan uh, from, from Canada, uh, uh, he wrote into an agreement that information from the project was to, the, to be deposited to an archive of local heritage associations. Could recording contracts start with such a default clause of providing that to, to an archival body? And I was thinking maybe Emily, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question actually? So basically what James is asking, he is asking if we should include a recording con in the recording contract, a clause about a depos uh, the deposit of the, of the data in an archive or local heritage association. If they, um, it can be wrote into the agreement. Yeah, um, I, I think that's an excellent idea. And um, I, I think that often 
already is the case in the um, the projects that I've worked on. But yes, I think that could become a standard thing. Um, but I'm just going to use that question um, at, for as a, a kind of a jumping off point to say one other thing that I, I don't think has been mentioned yet, but is very much relevant, again, to our readdressing the 1996 ICOMOS principles. And that has to do with our ability, our lack of ability to actually determine um, what's going to happen with technology. And while the difficult thing about ethics and technology is that we, we can't exactly predict the future. We can have good ideas about what likely will happen, but we don't know for certain. So it's very difficult to make statements that are based upon a reflected understanding of what a certain contract clause might be and its bearings on professional practice um, versus what it actually will look like in the future, depending on what the, um, I mean, even the, an earlier question about resolution, um, what is our standard for the, re the good, a good resolution of an image has changed drastically in the last five years. So it's very hard to say what will happen in the future. And we're trying to basically reflect upon um, how we can make rules, guidelines, and ethical um, considerations for things that we, we don't know which way it will go. So as we think about this further, I would just like to urge everyone to realize that we have to insert a degree of flexibility into our thinking about the space as technology emerges. Thank you, Emily. And with this, we close the session. I, I apologize because I didn't reach all the all the questions, but we will have a follow up um, uh, answer. Okay, so let's go to Lori. Hello, everyone. My name is Lori Smith, and I'm with the Insert Create Heritage Engineering Program, one of the sponsors of today's program. And I want to say, as the other speakers have, I'm very honored to be here, and also to have the opportunity to have the last word. So the first thing I want to do is to thank everybody who has been involved in the presentations today. I'll, I'll go through that in a minute. And then just to make a few comments on what we have achieved today and where we are, and then talk really briefly about next steps. So I encourage you to just hang on so that you can hear about the next steps part as well. So I want to start by thanking our three senior professionals who provided the introductions and the background to this topic, Stratos, Stalinitis, Chris Weeb and Mario Santana, we appreciate your wisdom and the context that you provided. It's always good to know where we've been before we figure out where we're going. Uh, a big thank you to the seven presenting professionals who are willing to put their new ideas out there. Julie Ivanoff, Will McGarry, Casey Haddock, Yuna Tebe, Eve Ubelman, and Elena Macchioni. And we appreciate your insights, the fresh ideas, and the amazing um, conversation that you uh, sparked. I want also to thank our four invited professionals who provided the questions and the commentary on the presentations, Alex Yen, Andreas Stergiopoulos, Mechthild Rossler, and Mona Hess. Uh, we appreciate your knowledge and experience, and I think you uh, really put us in a good place to uh, uh, start the questions off and hear from our audience as well. And I do want to thank everybody who posed questions. That was also a very important part of today's session. And lastly, I want to thank the professionals who helped organize the event and provided resources on behalf of their organization. Rebecca Napolitano, Joe Callis, Dathios Adamopoulos, Michelle Duong, and Mario Santana. And uh, I'm always amazed by your uh, dedication, your creativity, and your adeptness, both in advance and during this, uh, this webinar. This is quite the thing to watch. So uh, I won't spend much time. I think everybody's done a good job of summarizing. Just so just before we get to next steps, I want to make a few comments. Um, I think we covered a lot of very big topics that uh, we can move forward with. Uh, communication, consultation, accessibility, uh, ownership and control of digital documentation. We talked about who, who's at the table at the time of recording, uh, at the time of interpretation or dissemination, and also on a long-term basis. And throughout, we emphasize the importance of discussion, of listening, of our diversity of voices, of listening to the farmers, engaging with communities. And also, this is related to who's at the table, but who has control over all aspects? Who has control over gathering the data, using the data? Uh, what is the power of communication? Uh, and how do we impose control on people? Do we do it through laws, policy, private agreement? 
um, and, and uh, who we allow to access data. And also the very, and I, I thank Emily for pointing out the shifting expectations between the 1996 document that we'll be working with and where we are now in terms of accessibility, ownership, fair use, all kinds of issues. And, um, and lastly, and Emily also for this, uh, the responsibility to guide these discussions. So we've been talking about um, uh, discussion, but ethics at its heart is really about discussion. It's about thinking beyond our own personal interests to consider those of the community and the wider world. So when we create a code of conduct or a set of ethical principles, we're just agreeing on a framework for that behavior, for that ethical behavior, in which we're going to privilege the needs or priorities of a group above our own. And the importance of engaging in honest dialogue with each other in order to discover the realities and the true impacts of our actions. Um, so uh, sometimes we have to obviously revisit past principles. What might have been relevant in 1996 might no longer be relevant. So obviously we've started that dialogue today. I was impressed by the multiplicity of voices. I just want to comment that we didn't call on all the voices that we might have, and I know we're going to do that going forward. Sometimes logistics take over and we can't have everybody at the table that we want. So that's something that we'll continue to pursue. So where do we go from here? And now you, you've had a chance to read my next steps. So our goal today was to address the ECMOS principles for the recording of monuments, groups of buildings and sites, which were created in 1996, and consider whether they need to be rethought and reformulated. So what we want to do is form a working group to take a look at those principles, to draft a resolution that would go to the next ECMOS General Assembly at the end of this year, and if ECOMOS accepts that resolution, then a SIPA working group to revise the principles would be formally created and would work to establish a new set of principles. Uh, so in terms of steps, the first step is download today's recording, review it, share it, think more about the topics we discussed today. Uh, that's, that's, that's this week's task. Next week, by next week, we want to start to set up an informal working group to draft that resolution. Uh, the resolution is due in August. I don't have the date. I think it's in the last half of August, luckily, uh, that we would need to submit that resolution to ICOMOS, but we'll, we'll circle back to you on that. And we would also want to get feedback from everyone. Again, the importance of discussion. Uh, once that resolution is submitted, then the working group can start looking at who would be involved in uh, redrafting the principles and informally start that work. Um, so to get things started, uh, we've put a link on the on um, the screen, and I think uh, Michelle's just put it in the chat as well. If you want to copy that, uh, so that we can start creating a contact list uh, that are in, of people who are interested in uh, working on this. And you can indicate if you want to be actively involved, or if you would just like to continue to be updated and and be more of an observer. If you have any questions, you can speak to uh, Mario and his email is there. And that's all I have to say. I think I'm at my five minutes. Thank you to everyone for participating today. It was exhilarating. And I look forward to working with you on the rethinking of the 1996 principles. Michelle is just gonna have a final, final word. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. Great next steps. Looking forward to everybody signing up for our working group. Hopefully you'll participate or um, you'll, you can join our mailing list, as Lori said. So we just want to remind everybody that this recording will be emailed, emailed out. Um, it will be on the YouTube channels of CIPA EP and National Trust for Canada. And you, you will get a follow up email uh, to the answers that we didn't get to the answers to the questions we didn't get to today. So stay connected and we'll see you at the next webinar. Bye, everybody. Take care. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Guys.